than I ever could. Uh, but I need to tell you just a bit about his background. Um, Amats is from, you've always been at uh, uh, Tel Aviv University? Yeah. And he's emeritus now. He's keeping on, keeping on, perhaps and forever. And that's wonderful for those of us who are also approaching the time when that we, we might even be called on to retire. Um, one of the things that I didn't know until uh, recently about Amats, and I read this in the um, Leaders in Animal Behavior, the second generation book, that um, not only has he been a significant contributor to the debates about signal evolution as well as the levels of evolution, but in Israel he is well known uh, for his conservation work. So he, I think, defines himself also in terms of the work that he's done in conservation. When I first met Amos, I think it was 1978 or 76, something like that, so a very long time ago. And one of the things that struck me then, and that um, is still apparent, is that in that those Halesian days of new ideas about evolution, Ahmad Zahavi was among the most creative. And I um, think maybe there's a rule here that if you're creative when you're young, maybe you're creative when you get uh, middle-aged and when you get a little older. And that's certainly been the case for Ahmad's. Um, it's an extraordinary opportunity that he's here. Thank you very much, Ahmad's. Yeah. So. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, actually, all, nearly all what I will say to you, except for some things about chemical signaling in the body, it is in my book, the only book I have ever written. So the, really the talk is to interest you to go to the library to go to see the book, no, no, nothing in mathematics, simple English, edited by an English, uh, by uh, an American, so it is good English. And the idea, but the idea is not to put the black over white so that to uh, push it into people's mind. And what I want to do in this talk is to tell you the backbone of the idea, not very much of the details, so to persuade you that I am right in suggesting that individuals are being selected by two different selection mechanism, direct selection mechanisms. I don't believe in indirect selection. One, which selects for signals, and this mechanism is different from the selection of any other trait which is not a signal. Now let's go and try to persuade you that there are this, this distinction between the two mechanisms, and the implications of they are so far-reaching that they explain a lot of things that were, are unexplained by simple direct selection, and people invested a lot of ideas about reciprocity and kin selection and group selection. I believe all of them will go down the drain once people understand that the two distinct selection mechanisms on the individual. I want to make sure that we are we understand the definition of a signal. Physiologists take anything which has an impact on an organism as a signal. Sunrise, sunset, darkness, humidity, no. The, this is direct observation that the individual is doing and it can decide what it is good for it to do. But when somebody see danger, this is also observation. But if somebody calls danger, and other, other individuals react to it as if the danger is real, it had better be reliable information because it may, if it is not reliable, uh, the individual is cheated and is not doing whatever he wanted to use which would have been best for him. So a signal is not a consequence of observation. It's a consequence of getting something which represents observation or a suggestion from another individual. Okay, and you have to remember that. Now, in order to be reliable signal, signals have to have a handicap. A handicap is simply a test of the reliability of the signal. An easy example I'll take from human behavior. 
a, a rich man, a wealthy man, advertise his richness by being able to waste money. Why is it reliable? Because a poor man cannot do. If you put the test, can you waste? A poor man cannot do it. And the richer you are, the more you can waste. And rich people waste. They give donation to the university. They, they build. <laughs> They build car, uh, they take expensive cars, although simple car could have served them alike, and so on. If you want to show you are courageous, you do something which a frightened person will not do. Let's say jump from the top of a roof. But jumping from the top of a roof, which is a handicap to the, the frightened person, not the courageous one, will not show that you are rich. Neither wasting money can show that you are courageous. So the handicap, the test of the signal, has to have some logical relationship to the message to be delivered by the signal. So, and a test must be difficult to have a meaning. If you are given in university a test where everybody get 10 or 100, I don't know what is the top, it is not a test for anything. You had better not do a test in which everybody succeed alike. So a test is something which must be difficult so that it will distinguish between ones which are better and ones which are bad. So if somebody wants to say I am courageous, I am rich, I am motivated to mate with you or something like this, it must be such that individuals which are not as good as he is as in the way he it, the organism advertises, will not, will lose if they will try to signal. So a signal has a cost in fitness to a cheater because a poor man who wastes his money to say I am rich doesn't have anything to eat because he wasted his money is having a cost in fitness. For the rich, honest advertisement is a gain in fitness because now everybody knows he is rich. And that give him a do you know, then in the party that is made after the donation to the university, he meets the governor, he meets other businessmen, and he can do his business in a better way than otherwise. So the two mechanisms is, what is special in signals? You have, you invest to waste in order to increase your fitness by an honest signal. Any other trait, if you can get, let's say, you have to invest in order to get food. But if food is given freely, you save your investment and you are happier. So if getting food easier, you have a surplus of possibility to invest and you invest in something else. But if a signal is easily done, it has no function as a signal. So there are two selection mechanisms. What in which you are happier if the investment required is decreased, one in which you are happier if you can afford to invest without uh, being, uh, and can uh, survive with it in order to uh, be more efficient in advertisement. But the advertisement increases your fitness. So decreasing, uh, increasing efficiency, when you have to decrease the investment, you increase your efficiency in doing something which is not a signal. You make it more efficient to get whatever you wanted, increases your fitness. But in signaling, by decreasing, increasing your investment, you increase your fitness. And if I will have time, I'll tell, talk about the far-reaching implications of the interactions between these two uh, modes of selection. I want to uh, say something about the peacock tail from which I started to think about the, in, uh, the handicap principle, not the other, I was earlier iter, uh, iterating what is in the book, why peacock have a tail. I know now it was wrong. I had a very wise student in my class ask me, he doesn't believe in it. I tried to explain to him once more and once more and he didn't understand. I knew he's very wise. And I made a second thought about it and realized it is wrong. And then I came with the handicap principle. So I'll tell you, let's look on the tail of the peacock. Before it got the, t the long tail, it had the tail like hands. It is a kind of a partridge or a hen. 
and uh, these birds develop their tail in relation to the mass of the body. If it is a big, massive individual, it needs a longer tail to steer while it is flying. If it is a smaller individual, it needs a lesser tail. Let's say the variation between one and the other is of two, three centimeters in length. If you measure birds, you see this is the normal variation of efficient traits. But a female got a mutation, and I'm following here the Fisher argument of the runaway, those who know it. Uh, since that she can guess how massive is the male by looking at the length of the tail, because the ones, let's say, that had 21 centimeters tail were more massive than the ones which got only 19. And they, since they wanted to have a massive male to be their defender, they looked at the tail and they could get an idea how massive is the male just by looking at the tail. But they could classify the males into three sets, bad, 19 centimeters, 20 centimeter medium, 21 uh, massive male. But, uh, well, among the massive male, let's say among the best students in the class, everybody know there are five students in the class which are the best students, but the, there is a variation that nobody knows unless they, are, unless they are tested. So they go to the test, and one get 96, another 97, another 98, and 100. So now you can classify the good ones into uh, several subsets in, to pick the one you want. Same thing, so once the female started to assess males according to the length of the tail, it became an advantage to increase the tail length. Earlier, an increase in tail length was just a handicap which handicapped the bird because it had a longer tail than needed, which dragged the bird. But now, since the, it impressed the female, it became an advantage to compensate for the uh, impossibility for the bad effects of a longer tail than needed for steering. Any signal starts from a non-signal. So it started from something which was efficient, and now uh, the, uh, as a consequence of female preferences, males could benefit from increasing the length of the tail. But not everybody could increase it uh, to the same length, as Fischer suggested, that is where he was wrong, but the big males could increase it more in relation to the phenotypic quality, and the lesser ones could increase it less because they couldn't sustain the drag of a very long tail. So instead of being the variation 19, 20, and 21, it became 190, 200, and 210. So now every set could be classified into 10 subsets, and a female who wanted to pick a male according to that particular parameter could find the one she is interested in. But I warned you, as much as I know from human behavior and also from bird behavior, nobody is making a decision by one parameter. If you're making a decision about with one parameter, you can easily get wrong because a parameter can get wrong. So that is why often we test students for false by four test and why when birds want to advertise, they sing, they dance, they put color, they make movements, because if one parameter is getting out of correlation to the quality that it should advertise, you had better drop it out. How can you know it is out of correlation? By comparing it to the others. And you can easily make a mathematical uh, exercise to see if everybody gets 100 in a particular test, you had better drop it out in order to see better the variation about the quality of the students. And it is this inflation process that you drop a signal, which is a test to my idea that there are two distinct uh, selection mechanisms. And these things happened again and again in the history of man and the history of many animals, and it is something happening in the formation of uh, materials in our body and so on. How is it? I'll give you an example from the use of lace. At the time, lace was done by hand. You know what is lace? It, knitting little holes by very slender uh, uh, string. So it, you, it uh, required much uh, handwork for more experts. 
So it was very expensive, and people used it in the 18th century in Western Europe just to put a little bit of decoration on the sleeve, something here, something there. But then came the machines, and the machines could do it easily. Everybody could buy lace. And you see the pictures in the uh, end of the 18th century, just the beginning of uh, 17 and 18, you see people with a lot of lace all around and on their sleeves. And after you read it, they say, why are we doing it? It is because the ones who, which were still impressed by it didn't get reliable information. So people didn't react to the carriage of lace, and people stopped using lace. I called it inflation, like money is a signal for wealth. That is why I use the word inflation. If money is easy to get, the money has no value. That is the inflation process. And this thing has happened in decorations, in human beings. Like, uh, you know, the first Israelis who went to Kenya to visit came back loaded with big drums and spears and so on. But now when it is easy to go there, nobody comes from Kenya with the load of drums and spears because it says nothing. Everybody can go to Kenya. It doesn't sh show anything about your courage, you, the risk you will want to take, or the money you have got. Because medium people can uh, do it. It happened also in birds. There are birds called bower birds. And they make a stage on which the male is uh, functioning. And he dec the male decorates the stage with blue object. Other species decorate them with different objects. And this sat blue satin bower bird decorated the, the stage with blue objects. Because blue color is not so common in the environment. So it showed, although I have to guard the stage, I can still find it and decorate it. And nobody dares take it from me. So it is a show-off. But then a company of beer started having blue bottle corks. And people in the park uh, didn't, were not very careful to collect all the blue bottle corks. And there were abundant blue bottle corks in the area. And the birds stopped collecting blue uh, objects, stopped stealing them from the neighbors in order to show off blue and that turned into showing off by distracting the bowers of their neighbors. So this is the inflation. If signal is easy, it is, has no value. So increase your fitness by signaling, by investing in them. And the more you can invest, the better is the signal, if you are doing it in a reasonable way. In any other trade, if you can do the same thing with less investment, you are happier. And I believe this is the test of my idea that two kinds of signal of selection pressures are uh, functioning in nature. Now, once I thought about the handicap in the peacock tail, handicaps in other things, uh, people who followed the idea, it took a, long a lot of time until they accepted it. But once it was more or less acceptable by the evolutionary community, they uh, wanted to qualify. They say, it is needed only when somebody is your enemy and he may try to cheat you, give you wrong information. So you are better assess information coming from somebody you cannot trust. And I uh, want to claim here that all signals, even the signals which are made among the best friends who are sharing the same interest. And I will say something about signals inside the body where somatic cells are talking to other somatic cells by signals. All of them are loaded with handicaps because you are getting information from, a from, a second, a second, from another party. You do not observe the things that should affect your behavior. You rely on somebody else. Now, if somebody is your enemy and he is cheating you, it would be bad for you, therefore you had better test. But if your best friend is just a little bit stupid or is too hasty to give you a signal which is not reliable, you had better test information coming from a signal, whether it is coming from a foe or from a friend. How, and I will tell you how I started 
B, uh, because you can, uh, uh, we, I talked about the length of the tail of the peacock or wasting money, but we can uh, sh see handicaps in any signal, like if I, you know, people who want to treat one another, if somebody in my class is speaking while I'm talking and I don't like it very much, I stare at him. Stop and stare at him. He knows that I am aware of him talking and he stopped talking. And people can see that I am staring at somebody because I have a frame, which is my eyebrows, they are thick, so they, it is, they can be seen from far away. If I had slender uh, eyebrows like some girls do, they cannot show where their eyebrows are uh, fixed in relation to a fixed thing in their body, so they cannot show where they are looking exactly as somebody of age who has thick eyebrows and can say, I am watching you. Not, and even without moving my head, I just move my eyebrows, you can see that I'm looking at somebody else because there is a fixed frame to show what is the handicap in it if I stare at somebody. If I stare at somebody, it is a threat. Why is it a threat? Because somebody who is not as good in threatening, what is a threat? Do what I want, otherwise I will fight with you. Somebody who is threatening had to prepare to fight if the other one does not respect the threat. Now, if you are not sure of himself, whether you will be successful follow, if a fight follows, you want to know if the door is open to retreat, you want to know if a third party is not coming from your back, but if you can fix your star, you don't get all that information and you say, I don't need it because I am sure about the results if a fight will be. The same thing goes by, by look, you can say, I love you by look. You know, some boys, when they are interested in a girl, they can just look at her and they fix their eyes on the girl. They don't stare like this, but they put their eyebrows up, but they fix their tongue. What is the handicap in it? It takes time to, there must be a handicap. Oh, the handicap is simple. If I stare at her, if I fix my gaze at her, look, I miss that lady, and I miss that lady, and I miss that lady. <laughs> that is why it is reliable information to her that I am interested in her. If you are going to dinner and you, uh, boyfriend or whoever is all the time looking at other girls. Well, be well. <laughs> Anyhow, so uh, I decided to go into the modality of chemical signaling. You see, I can do it by gaze, I can do it by handicap. Uh, if you read by, in my book, what is the handicap in having hair, what is the handicap if, in having a nose, and so on. All of it uh, there is uh, many stories about po many possible, but one is the use of chemical signaling. And you know, men, when they gather in a pub, whether it is in Scotland, England, United States, Africa, or anywhere, are drinking alcoholic beverage. You don't have a pub for milk or a pub for juice. Why? Because people are very in their ability to drink alcohol without getting drunk and stay sober. A child cannot drink and stay sober as much as, as a man at its prime, and a man at its prime can uh, be sober more than an old man or a sick man, and men can do it more than uh, females. Females get drunk easier than men. And a student of mine, when I was telling, uh, I consider that variation, told me when I am in the class, in the semester, I can drink less than in, in autumn when I work manual work, because then when I'm doing man manual work, I can drink more without getting drunk. So people realized that somehow, and I won't go into the detail, uh, the ability to drink alcohol without getting drunk is a good quality of uh, Men, ability, men strength, and men are proud of it. You just have to be there and hear. Luckily, this species talk. So he say, I can drink five glasses and I'm sober and he just drink two and he's already drunk. And whether it is said in English or in Hebrew or in any other language, the, the, the advertisement is the same. And because of the handicap, people drink alcohol I'm not talking about the handicap of money that the government imposes on you. Okay, so with this uh, simple 
approach. I am not neither an endocrinologist nor a chemist. I decided, well, as an evolutionary scientist, I want, there must be, the handicap says, there should be a relationship between uh, the signal, the properties of the signal, is it the length of the tail, is it the fact that I am staring at somebody, is it the fact that I am drinking alcohol, and what do I want to advertise? So uh, I started to looking on such signals among uh, organisms, chemical signals. Uh, the alcohol of men is one of them, uh, and many of them, on, even on the first sight, seem to be noxious chemicals. But uh, I'm not sure I have the details, the time to go into the details of that. I believed that they should be noxious, like alcohol, if they want, if by which one individual want to advertise its advantage over the other. But then, I, I, reading in the literature, I realized that the same chemicals that are used among organisms, for instance, like cyclic AMP, used among slime molds, which are amoeba, small amoebas, in order to say, let's come together, they advertise it by cyclic AMP. But cyclic AMP is also used in the body. I expect a cyclic AMP, and I think I know where is the handicap in it, I don't know if I'll have time to it, but why should the body use it? In the body, all cells are of the same genetic quality, of the same genetic uh, program, and all of them have the interest to help the body. Why should they in have signals that are loaded with handicaps, rather go for efficient uh, communication, which uh, does not need uh, noxious chemicals. And if you read what are neurotransmitters, what is cyclic AMP, every one of them is noxious to the extent that you know, uh, one NO, natrium, uh, nitro nitrogen oxide, uh, is a very noxious molecule. And only about 20 years ago, it was uh, found to be a neurotransmitter. And I read a review on that molecule and its effect on the body. And the man who written the review, cited in my book, he said the following, everybody thinks natural selection is a logical process to make the organism as best as possible to function in the way they are. But the, why should an organism use nitrogen oxide in the communication in the brain, in the heart, in the gonads. That is the most silly thing I could have suggested to natural selection to, to select in order to communicate between a nerve and its uh, surroundings. In my family, all of them indoctrinated by the handicap principle, uh, we made a party that evening because we expected the signals inside the body to have a handicap. Why? because the signal is information being transferred from one to the other without the other being able to observe whether the information is good or not. So the signal must be a test to the information. And like I talked to you about being, uh, showing that you are rich by wasting money or jumping from the top of the roof but in order to show. So I decided I shall embark on trying to take something I know next to nothing about it and took a student who knew next to nothing about it and we started learning and reading about the steroids. And what we found is that steroids are not, I mean, you, you put a steroid like testosterone or estrogen in the computer, in the internet you get 50,000, 100,000 papers. And but we knew what we were looking for because we believed already then that the signal must have a handicap. So we looked for some noxious effect steroids do and we found them. Then we saw what is the correlation between the, no the amount of the steroids and some interesting phenomenon that the signal is carrying. And we found it because the steroids are correlated to the, metabol the metabolic activity in the gonads. It is the brain and the hypophysis that are giving orders to the gonads. Now you have come of age, 
start to develop like a man or a woman, a good commander wants to have a feedback. And it is the steroids that give feedback to the commanding organs, the hypophysis and the, and the brain, and also to other organs that have to be correlated with the development, what is happening in the gonads. And this information must be reliable. And the reliability is ascertained by the noxious effect. Unless the metabolism will be good, they will not be able to produce so much steroids that will harm them unless they can counter the effect by their metabolism. And I will not go into the details of it because that will call, and it is not yet published, those who are interested, there is a draft of a paper uh, with uh, Patty that uh, you can take wherever it is free, uh, although it is a draft and I don't mind that somebody will take the idea and publish it before I. I have uh, got my professorship and I am not uh, rushing for to say I was the first to say last. And it was the men who publicized the idea of alcohol as a handicap in advertisement is a man living in Los Angeles called uh, uh, Diamond. He's a physiologist, but he's also a bird watcher. And I think this is there where he get the ideas. As a physiologist, he can check them. But the ideas are coming from bird observation, and most of my ideas are coming from bird observation. I later try to speculate about them in other systems. Now, an uh, interesting uh, cake to little to the whole thing is why do men make testosterone, and why f uh, ad to advertise to the body that the gonads are functioning, and why do females do it with estrogen? because all steroids can give you the information about the metabolism in the gonads. The fact is that testosterone increases the efficiency of ATP production in your body by blocking leakage of protons from the proton pump. But the bad side of it is that it increases the oxidative processes in the cell. So a man who wants, when he is in his prime, to be strong, say, okay, I shall be less, my survival will be five years less than a woman, but I want to be strong when I am in my eight, 20s and my 30s, or even when I am 15, to uh, do it. So I don't mind the little harm. A female, a woman, does not uh, use strength to compete with other females. So why to uh, be uh, to sustain the harm of testosterone? So she gives the same information by, an, uh, by another chemical which is correlated to availability of testosterone and the other story, that is the estrogen. Estrogen reduces oxidative damage, but with the cost of not being able to produce as much ATP from certain oxidative process. So we got an answer to this little question, unless we looked for a handicap, and unless we knew as biologists what a male wishes to do and what a female wants to do, we will not be able to put the two uh, things together. I see I still have time to talk about important implications of understanding the handicap principle. One I want to stress, although I told it in the beginning, if you don't know the message encoded in a signal, because often the same signal, like I cannot show how strong I am now, but somehow my ability to show a muscle is related to my strength, and that is why people are showing the muscles. But the same information may attract a woman that looking for a strong mate, may deter a rival, or may take a collaborator who look for a collaborator to do a certain manual work. He's interested in somebody who is strong. So the signal is not, I am quoting you. The signal is not, I am deterring you. The signal is simply showing by a handicap what is the message encoded. But the same message can, code, can affect, have very many effects. So nobody, as I know, has used that simple logic 
to try and understand what is the message in particular signal. Although he know the signal, he know the effect, but why the system is affected by that signal, sometimes people don't understand. They just know the effect, and they study the effect. For medicine, it is very important to know the enzymes, the receptors, and the everything. But what is the message? It is not necessarily a consequence of the effect, because the same information can do can affect different system in a different way. So I wanted to stress that it is good to understand that and try to, to use it. Uh, I am studying, now go to implications. I study a system of cooperative birds called bubblers. And they display altruism to their group members. So altruism is in a way a handicap because you are not exploiting the options to be better than your rival or better than your competitor inside your group. You are taking resources or time or risk and invest it in the welfare of the others. And therefore it created problems and some people, had, most people explain it by kin selection, some by group selection, some by reciprocity. I have been living with the bubblers now for 40 years. I know them personally. I'm staying within them as if I was sitting among you. We, see, we know the language, we understand them perfectly well. We have evidence that their altruism is a signal, is a show off. Being in university, I have been uh, in the first, until I was 40, I was an administrator looking for donations. And you know that somebody donates you money, not necessarily interested what the university will do with the money, but he's interested in the placard that will be there, and he's interested whether the governor will be in the dinner in which they will open whatever he donated for. This is his interest. That is where he gained. So my bubblers are gaining as a consequence of their altruism. Altruism is a signal claiming social prestige. And social prestige is very, very important among the bubblers. If you want, read a chapter on the bubblers and about social prestige. It explains a lot of things. It, I have been living with the bubblers for 40 years, but I am living among the other species men for over 80 years. So although I didn't study, I observed men. And I can tell you, I can, from my experience, not as a scientist, as a man who was handling a system do, uh, collecting money and uh, doing politics, human altruism is also a signal, a show off of their abilities. And uh, so I don't need any indirect selection to explain why bir my birds and why uh, men uh, display altruism. But I decided, okay. But now, uh, in recent 20 years, microbiologists started to be interested in social behavior of bacteria, and people who study slime molds are interested in the altruism that slime molds uh, do, because in both systems, these unicellular organisms, when they are under stress, they make collaborations in which some 20, 30 percent, and sometimes 90 percent among bacteria die, and their death is of help to the surviving one. So, this, in a description way, it is as if it is altruism. I die for the sake of my country. I die for the sake of my society. I die for the sake of the community and so on. Why? Because we are the same genotype and I, all these excuses are there. I decided I shall go in and find out, reading the, liter uh, the literature, because I mean, you don't pick uh, an exotic uh, species to, to be able to assess whether you are right or wrong. So we took slime molds, with also thousands of papers about slime molds by various groups around the world, and we started to read about them. There is a whole chapter in the book, and I'm just going to tell you about the bottom line. The problem was, why should one sacrifice his life for the sake of others? But does he really die? What is sex? When we do sex, Somehow, we realized that just making partner genetic when we shall invest all of our resources in our genetic is a bad strategy, 
And we used only 50% of our genetic to make a collaboration with somebody who will give the other blue. That is the best way to transfer our genes to the next generation. But whether the collaboration is done between somebody who's giving exactly, I give 50 and you give 50, or somebody because he can, he can give a million dollars and the other one collaborate with him with one dollar. Like, I mean, you look on a factory, which is like some uh, entity that works, you see the director gets $100,000 and the man who scrubbed the floor uh, getting only $2 or $3, which is next to nothing to the director, but the, the, the factory works. And if you go and ask a, a zoologist who will watch it, you say, obviously he works because if he will do his role in the, in the collaboration, the factory will not work. So everybody has its role. Somebody gets more and somebody gets less. And I looked for the very little benefit that the dying organism may have when they are do active death. They are, the one who scrap the floor is active in order to get the two dollars. The cells that are dying are not dying uh, just because they collapsed. They have make an active cell death, which is apoptosis-like. They activate genes that the other surviving ones are not activating. If there are certain genes that they activate when they are about to die, there must be a selection advantage. Those who explained by kin selection think that the kin selection uh, is the advantage. I looked for individual advantage, not in a, as a signal necessarily. And I think at least I have a suggestion and one of the reasons I'm going around universities now is to find the microbiologist that will do the experiment to show it, that it really functions like this. Under stress, they collaborate. Why do they collaborate? Because there is no other way to survive if you are alone. So, but once you are in a collaboration, not everybody can succeed alike. There are slime molds which go into the collaboration well-fed and still, just before they uh, divided uh, having a mitosis, there were ones that the stress happened just after they did the mitosis, so the, uh, meta uh, the uh, metabolites are much less. And it is well known, and I've done ex there are experiments, many experiments that have done, that if you mix two strains, one which is well fed and the other which underfed, the underfed strain will die more than the well-fed strain. Now, the ones who are going to make a spore in order to survive in the collaboration, they want to defend themselves. So when you are sleeping, the uh, one strategy of defense is you make yourself sour. You put noxious material in your body so it won't be of value to a nematode to eat you because the harm done by the noxious chemical uh, will outweigh the protein benefit. So we suggested that if the material by which they tell the other cells that was the, that is the, what well, to read in the books, go and buy for us, is simply a poison that they have put on themselves in order to survive uh, predation. And when my student who did with me the model, I'm just telling you the beginning of it, went to a conference, uh, somebody luckily came to the conference and had evidence that this, what was considered a signal is also a poison. Now, okay, that poison, you can think about it as a smoke. They smoke themselves. They can compensate for the inefficient, now, what is the poison? The poison is poisoning the efficiency of mitochondria. So this well-fed, organisms are doing at the same time more mitochondria in order to comp compensate for the inefficiency. The ones that don't have enough metabolism, they cannot make new mitochondria, and um, so they realize that they will die out. So what is the other option open to them? And there is another option. You make apoptosis-like active cell death. You put, condense your DNA, you cut it into pieces which contain genes, and with the option that a gene, one of your genes may transfect the survivors when they sprout. It is just an idea. The only backing to it I have is from two, so this is an advantage. If you're sure you are going to die, 
you do the best out of it, perhaps one of my genes will transfect, or two of my genes will transfect, perhaps nothing. But everything which is possible is better than sure nothing. So this is just the, the strategy of the inferior ones. What is the evidence? In our body, supporting it is not a big support. Only experiment will show it. And I was just visiting a university where a friend of mine is a slime mold researcher to talk with him about that. Uh, in slime molds, the apoptosis is cutting the DNA into long pieces, thousand DNA bases long. When we want to get rid of information, we cut in our apoptosis inside the body into very short pieces of 100, 200 uh, base per uh, long because that will destroy information. You cannot usually make a protein from these short pieces. The other is that all, all microbiologists know that after there is a collaboration called the biofilm among bacteria, the genetic variability increases. What does it mean genetic variability increases? That some genes have passed from one organism to the other. Who is the one that contributes the, the variability and who is the one that accepts it? I don't know but it at least show a, a, a possibility that I am right, that even among unicellular organism, altruism is not alt altruism, it is look like an altruism because it helps the survivors, but <coughs> it also helps the ones who are dying because that is the best they can to increase the fitness. And uh, perhaps one thing more, I mean, there are many implications to it. There are many <coughs> problems in biology, how you get from being a good reptile into being a bird. If, if a, a evolution is working on the best individuals of the reptiles, you cannot change a, a, something which is very well adapted as a reptile, covered with scales, into one which has feathers. Only changing the scales may disrupt, may destroy the adaptation. So, and it is not just, just one mutation may lead you into making feathers pop, a certain series of mutation. But if you have two selection mechanisms, one which is increasing efficiency, and other decreasing efficiency, reptiles, by showing off, can change their scales into something which can easier later be uh, evolved into something which is useful. I'll give you an example from your history. If the late Kennedy president, wanted to, well, he was aware that the Americans are having the best technology in the world. So he would come to the Senate and say, let us invest $20 billion into developing the technology of the 21st century so that in the 21st century we will be ahead of everybody else also. Nobody will give him the money because even he couldn't say where to invest it. But when he wanted to say, let's be, send the first man to the moon, and be there first before the Russians are there. They gave him the 20 or 10 billion dollars. Now, in order to go to the moon, they had to invest in computer technology, in material technology, in all the technologies which were the base of the technology of the 21st century, or the late 20th century. But you couldn't reach there unless you invested. And the show-off is calling you for investment that sometimes leads you to a place from which you can spring something new. I can give you the same thing, do I still? Uh, from the evolution of horns. You know horns on deer, they are just outgrowth of epidermal cells. But they have to be growing in a particular place, in a symmetrical way, and they are of help only once they have developed. How can evolution put an outgrowth of a mutation that will make an outgrowth of epidermal cell exactly here? And it is very simple. I showed you how watching somebody gives uh, information. But if somebody is over there and he doesn't see my eyeballs, I can, not, I can put lines here, or like in oils, the feathers above, to show whether I am looking this way or that way. OK? That is of help to know which side I am watching. So the same thing, outgrowth of epidermal cells here and there will not give you information, will not be able to let you uh, use it as information. But outgrowth, symmetrical outgrowth here will tell you 
I am watching you. So you grow them and you grow them from a distance. You can see if you watch an ungulate, which side he is looking by the symmetry of his uh, horns. Then you only have to make them into hard material to fight with them, into efficient weapons that otherwise would not be able to put them here. And then comes somebody and say, well, everybody is with an efficient bottom. I can carve my uh, holes, or I can make them like a bush in deer, because you're fighting with me with a dagger or with a sword. I can fight with you with a club. So I'm better than you because I can win it with a club when you're coming with a dagger. So you can curve your holes and increase the information. And then comes the deer from the Arctic, and the antlers are so big, and now we can use the lower part of the antlers to scrap the snow to make them once more into an efficient tool. So the interaction between two kinds of selection can lead you to develop things that otherwise you wouldn't be able to do. With this, I shall conclude to say, if I believe that if people will follow it, the, the problem, Darwin was already facing the problem because he realized that just by selection for efficiency, he cannot explain what he sees in the world. And he suggested sexual selection to explain, but not the mechanism by which selection, sexual selection happens. He made a mistake in the definition, but because it is really the signaling part in sexual selection in his way definition that created the problem. Why do they show off, invest in the show off? And he didn't realize that sex signals are not, in fact, anything different than any other signal that signal give a message in another context rather than sex. So sexual selection is just a definition of characters related to sex, but there is nothing, no me special mechanism that makes sexual selection as a distinct uh, set of signals or traits. But signal selection differentiate traits into signals and non-signals that they are selected by different signaling mechanism and they lead to understanding of various phenomena. But I believe that, I can't say I'm sure, but I believe that if people will start using it, they will not need kill selection, group selection, or reciprocity. They will realize that individuals are always doing the best of that they can do, and often by compete, you can compete with your enemy by being an altruistic. You don't have to uh, do it by fighting. By, and uh, if you read the chapter on the bubblers, how they compete in order to invest in their group, like the mayor of this city competed to be the mayor, although if you ask him why did you do it, he said, I did it in order to serve the people of Los Angeles. Do you know how many competitors would have liked to do the same thing? He could save all his trouble of being the mayor of Los Angeles by letting others. No, he competed to act as altruist uh, in order to be the mayor of Los Angeles. What is the advantages he get from that? You could explore. Thank you. Questions. We have time. Yeah. We, I we don't mind to stay at two hours here with the people who we want have to ask time questions. For questions as long as you want to ask them. Excuse yeah. me. Uh, the fact that the handicap principle is important, <coughs> and you make a good case for it, does not mean that other mechanisms uh, are not no. important. So, what is your argument that you think you are saying very insistent that key selection? It's not important. No, the, all, uh, the indirect selection mechanisms are logical suggestions, but they are not stable because they are open to social parasites. Why people in the 50s of the last century had the discussion whether group selection occur or not, they say group selection cannot occur because individuals can exploit a mechanism established on group selection. The same thing, I believe, goes you can cheat in kin selection, you can cheat in, uh, uh, in uh, oh, I forgot the English words. Yeah. Anyhow, you can cheat about in indirect mechanism. You cannot cheat on direct selection. A handicap is a test for signals and a test for whatever you want to do. 
And while indirect selection is prone to, is uh, open to social parasitism. So that is why I believe it does not exist. But this is uh, not a strong argument, but if I look on system that the only explanation for which was indirect selection, and I find argument that I can explain it with individual selection, why by one by one the whole need of indirect selection will be wiped out? And I hope you will help me in that. Oh yeah, but this is called, I think I have an idea what is the handicap in the communication in the pheromones of the queen by which she asked the workers to help her. But this is a talk by itself, like I didn't tell you about evidence, why, my, why I say that my bubblers uh, use altruism as a selfish thing, because that by itself would be a seminar. But I have evidence that they compete to act as altruists. And if somebody likes to compete with them, they even shut him up and they may even kill him if he is uh, trying too much. Because altruism is simply saying, I want to be the dominant. I claim my dominance. You don't agree with it? So you better agree if you don't want to fight. <laughs> This upside down way of looking at things take time until you learn how to look at it. That something which looks to be bad is actually good. And uh, there are things which are good because they are good, and these are the other traits, and there are things with that are good because they are bad, and these are the signals. To find in what way something is bad is not easy. Does anybody else have a question? Well, I was also curious about you social insects, and so since you don't have any other questions, well, I can give you. Present your hypothesis. No, I mean the. What you want to do is first of all understand the collaboration, why the collaboration is made of. What are the options open to a worker? What are the options open to a uh, princess that, that is uh, opting to be a queen? Then uh, you see that they talk with chemicals, okay? And in some insect system, they are aggressive. In uh, very small communities of uh, wasps, they are having the, making their dominance by aggression. But when you are looking on huge beehives, uh, uh, honeybees hives, they are, it is done by signals. And the signal they are using are chemicals, I believe, that handicap the use of uh, the fat in uh, the body. So if you can show off a lot of the chemicals, you are showing how good is your fat reservoirs by which the, the queen is telling the, the workers that she is good in laying eggs. And it is well known that if she not laying very many eggs, pheromone decline. And that correlation is there because the pheromones harm the fat. Why should workers be attentive to the fat metabolism of the queen in order to serve her? This is a complicated story, I, I can't... Uh, but the chemical nature of the signal the handicap of it is the double bond and the uh, keto group and the alcohol group in the chemical signal that probably interferes with fat metabolism because it is done in the fat organ. So shall we